When learning about cellular biology, it is important to understand the specifics about the cell membrane. This structure provides a barrier that separates the internal components of the cell from the exterior, and also controls what moves in and out. Let's go over a few important details about how this works. Every cell membrane is primarily made up of structures called phospholipids. These individual molecules contain a head made up of glycerol, phosphate, and a variable region, and tails that are fatty acid chains. The variable region of the phospholipid head is polar, meaning it is attracted to other polar molecules like water. And the tail ends are nonpolar, meaning they repel water. These structures take on the terms hydrophilic and hydrophobic for these properties. And because the entire phospholipid has regions that are polar and nonpolar, we can say the molecule is amphipathic. This difference in polarity within different regions of the molecule allows interesting formations to take shape when many phospholipids are in the presence of water. What happens is the nonpolar tails of the molecules tend to stick together, repelling any polar water molecules. This leaves the polar heads openly in contact with the water, which is fine because their unbalanced charges allow it. Put enough of these molecules together and a double membrane structure is created that can separate and completely enclose internal components from the outside. This is our cell membrane. While the cell membrane has many phospholipids that make up its structure, they are not the only molecules that are part of the system. Proteins play a very large role in cell membrane function. There are different types of protein molecules that can be found in the cell membrane. Some examples include integral proteins, which are larger proteins that span across both sides of the phospholipid bilayer, and peripheral proteins that can attach to one surface of the bilayer without penetrating all the way through. These proteins follow the polarity structure of the phospholipids they are next to, meaning polar ends of protein molecules point out towards any aqueous solution and the nonpolar regions are found next to the fatty acid tails in the middle of the membrane. The functions of these membrane proteins are vast and include transport, cell-to-cell -cell recognition, attachment or anchorage, and many others that we will discuss throughout the course. Another important structure found in the cell membrane is cholesterol, which is only seen in animal cell membranes. Cholesterol, just like the phospholipids we discussed earlier, is also an amphipathic molecule, meaning it has those polar and nonpolar regions. The hydrophobic part of cholesterol, which is made up of the steroid ring and hydrocarbon tail, can be found embedded within the tails of the phospholipids. The hydrophilic portion of the molecule, which is a hydroxyl group, peaks out between the heads of the phospholipids making contact with the exterior solution. One of the main functions of cholesterol is to control the fluidity of the cell membrane. Phospholipids and proteins found within the cell membrane are constantly in motion, and if the environment heats up, that motion is increased and can become unstable. Cholesterol molecules within the membrane act as a stabilizing component that reduces the fluidity, meaning the phospholipids will not be able to move around as much. So even if the system heats up, cholesterol helps hold it together, preventing it from completely breaking down. This graph shows the impact of cholesterol on membrane fluidity based on the increase in temperature. It helps decrease the fluidity at high temperatures, but it also increases it at low temperatures by separating phospholipid tails to prevent crystallization of the membrane. This keeps the cell membrane working within the normal limits of homeostasis for animals. At this point in our collective understanding, scientists know a whole lot about the cell membrane, but there was a time when this information was yet to be discovered. Advances in microscopy in the 1930s prompted scientists to figure out the structure of the cell membrane. An early model was created by Hugh Davison and James Daniele, which we call the davison daniele model. They attempted to describe how protein and lipid molecules were structured in the cell membrane and came to the conclusion based on microscopic observation that proteins were layered on either side of a lipid layer. This resulted in a structure that looked like this, protein, lipid, protein. Today we know that this model is incorrect and it was disproven by Seymour Singer and Garth Nicholson in the 1970s. They used a few techniques like fluorescent tagging and freeze fracturing to create a new understanding of the cell membrane. Tagging proteins with fluorescent markers showed that membrane proteins were mobile, meaning they did not sit in a solid layer. This questioned the original model that had two separate layers of proteins with the consistent ratio. 
Additionally, freeze factoring allowed them to split the membrane in half and view the internal components, which was not as uniform as the original model. They found proteins were also inside of the membrane, between the lipids as they were viewed as irregular rough surfaces. Their model, called the Singer-Nicholson model, was proposed after these findings and is the model we still use today. This is also known as the fluid mosaic model. Mosaic because there are many different structures found within it, and fluid because these structures are constantly in motion, bumping into and moving past each other while still maintaining the barrier that separates the inside of the cell from the outside. The cell membrane, being the barrier that separates the inside of the cell from the outside, helps control the movement of particles in both directions. There are many ways that particle movement can happen across the cell, but before we talk about each one, let's first categorize all movement into two types, passive or active. Passive movement describes when substances make their way across the membrane without the use of cellular energy, and active movement describes when substances require cellular energy, like ATP, to move from one side of the membrane to another. Let's dive in. Our first example is called simple diffusion, which is when molecules are able to move freely through the membrane without energy and without assistance. This only occurs with small, nonpolar molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide. The rate of diffusion of these molecules can be impacted by temperature and the severity of the concentration gradient pushing them either into or out of the cell. Molecules, without the use of energy, only move from high concentrations to low concentrations, which is our literal definition for diffusion. Next up, we have facilitated diffusion. Like simple diffusion, this process does not require energy. Molecules can simply move from a high concentration to a low concentration to get across the membrane. But the facilitated term here means that the molecules get some assistance along the way from an integral protein channel. These protein channels help larger, polar molecules and ions move across the cell membrane, but only when they are open. If the protein channel is closed, no luck getting through to the other side. More on that later. Next, we have a special term called osmosis, which refers to the diffusion of one type of particle across the cell membrane, water. Water plays a role in all living organisms and a very important one within and around cells. Osmosis is a process that describes how water molecules move from a high concentration to a low concentration across the cell membrane, which is partially permeable to water. This partial permeability means that water molecules are able to diffuse through the cell membrane, but if a large amount of molecules need to be moved, cells have a special protein channel called an aquaporin that functions to only facilitate the movement of water. You can think of this as a special type of passive facilitated diffusion. As stated on the last slide, water has the ability to move across the cell membrane, but which way does it move? In or out? The answer, it depends. Water can move in and out of cells at different rates based on the concentration of solute that exists within the system. We said that the cell membrane is partially permeable to water but it is not permeable to many other substances that are dissolved in water. We call these dissolved substances solutes, which makes the water the solvent, or the liquid that the solute is dissolved in. To understand this movement, we also need to remember that water passively moves from where it has a high concentration to where it has a low concentration. This happens naturally without energy. But how can that concentration be determined? We can compare the amount of water molecules, or solvent, in a given area to the amount of solute. Let's say that we have a membrane that water can cross through, but sugar cannot. To keep it simple, let's count particles and say we have 8 sugar molecules on this side and 27 on this side. So a low concentration of sugar, or solute, here, and a high concentration here. Now they have roughly the same volume, so which side has more water? Well, because there are less sugar molecules on the left, there would be more water molecules needed to fill the solution up to that same volume. And on the right, we would have less water molecules because some of the space is taken up by the sugar. If we let this sit, and water is the only molecule that can pass through the membrane, we will see that water will move from its low concentration to its high concentration, 
so much so that it will diffuse until there is an equal amount of water that sits between all sugar molecules on both sides. The same thing happens with cells. If there is a high concentration of solute outside of the cell, we call that a hypertonic solution. Water, to be balanced, will naturally diffuse out, potentially leaving the cell shriveled. If the solution outside of the cell has a low amount of solute compared to the inside, we call it a hypotonic solution, meaning water will naturally diffuse into the cell, potentially causing it to swell and burst. And finally, if the solution outside of the cell has an equal amount of solute compared to the inside of the cell, we call this an isotonic solution. Water is still moving here, it just moves in an equal rate both in and out of the cell. We can see here that an isotonic solution is optimal for both plant and animal cells. Active transport is another important type of transport to move substances across the cell membrane. With active transport, particles are moved against their concentration gradient, which means they will move from a low concentration to a high concentration. You can compare this to swimming up a stream against the natural current. It's going to take a lot of energy to get to the end. The same thing happens here with particles. Naturally, they move high to low, which is called diffusion and is described by passive transport, but if the cell needs to move them from low to high, they will use cellular energy in the form of ATP to get the job done. Active transport is supported by protein channels which use the ATP to move the particles across the membrane. Let's take a look at a specific example of active transport using a well-known protein called the sodium potassium pump. This protein is found in many cells within your body, but plays a critical role with balancing and maintaining concentration gradients in neurons, which are specialized cells that make up your nervous system, which you will learn more about in section 6.5. What we need to know now is that for neurons to work properly, they require a specific resting gradient of sodium and potassium ions. They need to have a high concentration of sodium on the outside and potassium on the inside. To achieve this goal, they use the sodium potassium pump. The process starts when three sodium ions bind to the internal sites of the pump. From there, an ATP molecule transfers a phosphate group onto the protein channel, which uses the released energy to alter its shape and move the sodium to the extracellular space. This alteration also opens up two sites for potassium to bind. Once the potassium is locked in, the phosphate group is released from the protein which causes its shape to revert back to its original form, releasing the two potassium ions into the cell. This process continues to build a gradient of sodium on the outside of the cell and potassium on the inside, always with the same ratio of three sodium to two potassium moved via the pump. And again, this is active transport because both ions are being forced to move from low to high concentration, which requires that ATP. Moving individual molecules one by one across the cell membrane is great, but what if the cell needs to move a large amount of particles at one time? The answer is bulk transport. The cell membrane, being made up of phospholipids and proteins in constant motion, is able to move large amounts of particles both into and out of the cell by using actual pieces of its membrane. This happens in one of two ways, depending on if the bulk substance is being moved into or out of the cell. In either method, energy, such as ATP, is being used in the process. If the cell is taking in a large sum of particles from the outside, we call this process endocytosis. The membrane creates a depressed groove that eventually folds into itself trapping a relatively large amount of solution. It then pinches off from the original membrane and can move internally within the cell. The cool thing about this process is that at this point, the substance has not crossed the cell membrane as it is still enclosed by a double layer of phospholipids. Pretty cool. If we take this process and reverse the steps, which takes a large sum of particles and moves them out of the cell, we call it exocytosis. A vesicle from within the cell made out of a phospholipid bilayer can fuse with the existing cell membrane. The attachment will push the internal contents to the cell's exterior and fully fuse with the membrane, increasing its size. The constant endo and exocytosis with the fusion and creation of vesicles level out the gain or loss of phospholipids in the cell membrane. 
As we learned on the last slide, bulk transport is very important for cellular function, and it is only possible with the use of vesicles. A vesicle is a small container made up of the same components of the cell membrane. They can be created by the cell membrane via the process of endocytosis or by specific organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. They are used in endo and exocytosis, constantly taking and replacing pieces of membranes within organelles and the larger cell membrane. This is the primary source of how material can be packaged and moved around within the cell. Looking at the image, we can see an important pathway here where substances are created in the ER, moved via a vesicle to the Golgi, and repackaged at the Golgi to be moved to another location, like the cell's exterior. The opportunities for movement are endless. Music